Great, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here at the AI Summit. I'm uh, really thrilled and honored. And uh, the opportunity, I love the opportunity to sort of expand the conversation uh, to some new areas that we've been thinking about really deeply in our, at our studio at Zio Design uh, within the realm of what uh, player experiences are and how computers can create richer and deeper emotions. So we're gonna talk today about red pill, yeah, red pill, blue pill, narrative AI for deeper emotions. And in it, we're taking, uh, we're gonna leverage some um, experiences that I've had, uh, and if, uh, you also have had, you know, in, the, in one of the most emotional meeting we have, which is, of course, um, uh, cinema. So I'm uh, the, one of the leading experts on emotion in games, and I have uh, a model called the Four Keys to Fun, which I used, um, I basically measured emotion on people's faces while they played, and uh, I created a model about how, what kinds of actions players did uh, to create different emotions. So from that perspective is what we're gonna do uh, today. I've also, um, I've also studied psychology at Stanford and a little bit of, uh, of filmmaking. The Four Keys has been used to uh, inspire the uh, AI for The Sims. It's, uh, we brought Wonder to Mist. We actually created some uh, AR and VR UI for iFluence and uh, you know, did Star Wars, Star Wars on Star Wars games. And the four keys is actually going beyond the realm of games in a sense that this model of how action and emotion interact uh, has, we've done, I've done work to anyone, with everyone from Samantha B to, uh, to Ted, um, IBM Watson, the sen sen uh, semantic analysis, sentiment analysis on IBM Watson is inspired by, by my work. And then we're doing a, a stuff on um, emotion, a lot of emotion in XR and VR. So we're gonna talk a little tiny, tiny bit about that uh, because I think that the, on the computer side, AI plays a key role in some of these newer uh, game platforms, especially with AR. Uh, this is a montage from one of, a work, one of the games I'm working on um, called Aladdin's Cave of Wonder. We're doing it on Magic Leap. So a combination of you know, real world item recognition and being able to recognize your hand gestures is gonna create a much deeper experience. Uh, for, for players, but not out of the box. We really have to understand what emotion is and how, how it gets done. So this is the Four Keys to Fun. You can download it on our website. Uh, there's some white papers and other talks. We're gonna go into um, not so much the Four Keys, but how it applies to uh, AI. We're in the process of a many year journey of developing in, stu in our studio an emotion engine, we like to call it. Uh, it's a way of creating uh, emotions from the actions in, in games. A few quick things on emotion. The first thing is that in games, best-selling games, people's favorite games, that mechanics tend to fall into nested loops. Uh, here are, are four of them. You know, there's a, um, there is a, a micro loop, a core loop, a meta loop, and a social re-engagement loop. And that uh, emotion and cognition are intertwined. So that may not necessarily be represented in your AI implementation, but we need to know on the wetware, they're definitely, they definitely coexist. Sense making and emotions um, are the thing. Actions and feeling are also related, and so if we ignore the player action as a, a vital agent in our AI systems, uh, then we are um, ignoring uh, a, most of what, a lot of what they feel. And so interaction, in a sense, designs emotion, as well as art and acting and other things that you may have already built um, AI systems around. Now, just like you know, birds and planes, you know, they both fly, but they fly differently. Okay, uh, same thing is true with games. Both movies create emotion and games create emotion. But they also you know, have different mechanics, different ways of going about it. Now when we start any genre, any new genre often leverages the old genre. So we have a lot to learn from film. Uh, but we also wanna take and you know, scrape away the stuff that maybe we don't, we don't need. Uh, so this is some scenes from Detroit which has got an amazing narrative design. Uh, for the characters, uh, the three main characters especially. But there are 3,000 pages of shooting script, which took two and a half years to shoot, which is way beyond the, the production length of most feature films. And we've got a very labor-intensive uh, branching narrative that you have to design by hand, you know, construct, you know, construct by hand to create the compelling you know, character arcs and other things. So in thinking for this talk, what I wanted to do was look at, well, what could we do instead of branching narrative? How could we apply other systems to the core of the game? Uh, so narrative is what, interactive narrative is what got me into games, you know, 26 years ago. And uh, it's still what keeps me, you know, coming back. So what would that narrative AI look like? 
well, some simple, very simple uh, AI systems, you know, that we already have, like, you know, this, that increases engagement. So, the, you know, the rubber banding that in Mario Kart keeps it interacting, engaging, even if you're working with an NPC or if you're, you know, playing with your friends. Uh, but then, let's say we do, but AI, modern AI, has done some really interesting things. And I thought for inspiration, here's where my sort of talk begins. If we think about the fake faces, how many people have seen this, this video? Yeah, not, not too many, okay. So there are three layers to the, um, to the generative adversarial, net, uh, adverse <laughs> adversarial networks. Uh, there are the, um, on three layers. And what they're able to do is they're able to create real looking faces that actually don't exist. So there are different features that they are leveraging at the three, at the three layers. And then they can apply this also to technique to other things to create believable styles. So on the right, you have hotel rooms that don't exist, and on the left, cars that don't exist. So what might this mean in terms of gameplay? Might we be able to create AI systems that actually designed game mechanics for us or created more robust things uh, for us? Well, I think that we want to look at it like a peanut butter cup. I like chocolate. I don't know about you. But uh, you, know, you know, there's a center of game, which I think is still going to be the game mechanic. But as a first step, we could probably design the chocolate coating. We could probably design a layer of AI, of narrative AI, surrounding the core experience that expands the emotional palette, the emotion architecture, the, the ebb and flow of the emotions in the player. So but here's a few more things to do that. The first is that in cognition and emotion, there's really, you know, threat of life is just one way of generating emotion. It just generates one emotion. And the other thing is that in the neocortex and the lizard brain, the neocortex is where we take action, whereas the lizard brain, your emotion centers are deeper down. You make decisions in the forebrain. You feel the result of them in your, in your, in your, in your inner brain, your, your older brain. And so it is the interaction between the, uh, the key to creating emotions for people is the key is really making those choices. So going from between those two parts of your brain back and forth and how you feel before, during, and after. So when we're designing a narrative AI, we want to think about that whole sequence if we want to think about the problem as a, as a whole from the top down. So in a game, what we have is uh, you know a dungeon master, uh, an NPC, you know, choices that we make, items in the world, and players. Might these all, might all five of these be a uh, inspiration or a layer or a set of layers, you know, inside an AI system for designing game mechanics? And I think they can. And if we wanted to approach uh, an AI, um, an AI-driven game mechanic, AI narrative, we'd want to think about layered AI. And where the player experience, because the player experience comes from these multiple layers as they move through, I think that the, uh, the AI coordinating the effect of these different levels of AI is super essential for uh, creating emotional, uh, intense emotional responses <clears throat> on the player. So for as a, a model for this, we might take the, the four keys, for example, because it's a reliable way of creating emotion through mechanics, and look at the uh, different types of fun. So you might have easy fun, I call it the bubble wrap of game design, just running around the world. You know, it's curiosity, wonder, and surprise, emotion-driven. You might have the hard fun, which is usually your core mechanic, the frustration that leads to fiero, the feeling of winning. Uh, you might also have people fun, which is the social interaction, amusement, nachis, schadenfreude, uh, those, the social interactions which make uh, games a lot, of, a lot more fun. It's the game play on the couch, not so much on the screen, on a console game. And then, of course, serious fun. Well, it's like, it's like people going up to Fortnite, and they're not there to play the game. They're just there to hang out, right? It's the Fortnite is the shopping mall of the current generation. Uh, so serious fun, uh, you know, the creating the desire to acquire, the zen-like focus. It makes winning feel more winning. It also makes, makes the game feel less like a waste of time. So they're all great game mechanics. And again, you can find out more about the four keys uh, elsewhere. But for today, I really want to focus this back on AI. Uh, so for the AI, um, what we've got is we want to look at an AI system, AI layers, that might generate or provide the opportunity to generate these different emotion sets. And I should say another thing about emotion is we can't actually you know, generate um, uh, an emotion specifically. I can't just, you know, hey, here's an emotion. But as a game designer, I could give you a little lever and say, hey, you know, as a game designer, I say, like, hey, pull this lever and you might feel something. 
And so that's what, you know, that's what we mean. So the AI could dynamically offer choices, offer opportunities to interact uh, in a way over time that then could be orchestrated um, along, um, along several layers to hit uh, these, a, number of different, um, a number of different emotional responses. And then to do that, many AI, uh, many AI uh, approaches now what might focus on the meta, like the dungeon master, might focus just on NPC, believable NPCs, might just focus on you know, interplayer you know, collaboration. But what we want is we want each layer of the AI to work, to work together. And it kind of, my vision of this, um, and obviously this is not code, but uh, the, my vision is this, like if you have the player and they're very emotional, they're going down the path, right? And it encounters you know, your AI system, and then that has multiple layers, which have different emotional responses, or the potential for different emotional responses coming from those layers. It senses that the player is nearby and also the emotional state of the player, and in context, um, you know, moves its, um, uh, its emotion, you know, its emotions, uh, its opportunity for emotions, more towards a certain direction that might be compatible with what the player's feeling. The player feels that way, and then a second AI might come in to that, and then uh, add addition, an additional emotion as the player moves through. So the player moves through, they might encounter another item, have an emotional response to that, and then an AI could come in, uh, another, the AI layer could come in and maybe uh, offer a different opportunities for different emotions or perhaps redirect from the candlestick in our murder mystery, AR murder mystery to maybe the tennis shoe, which is the, which is the actual clue. And that could result in, you know, in the player being more uh, emotional or more, more happy. So these four patterns for AI, layer AI is what I'd like to uh, finish the talk with. And so we're going to look at some films um, about and talk about these different frameworks. Uh, the first one is a frame. Uh, we're going to talk about making choices, uh, sort of onions and layering and arcs, character arcs, as well as, uh, as, well as the opportunity to create uh, emotion from items. So we'll talk about frames. I don't know how many people have, have really thought about this, but I thought there's a, a remarkable some familiarity or similarity between Hunger Games and Fortnite. And so what's interesting is that with the Hunger Games, there's actually a, a framework, if you know Min Minsky's frames, right? Uh, that frame of the movie actually tells you how to feel um, about, the, uh, about the game. So if you had an AI that was uh, filled with a number of different frames of encounters, they could, you could predict the emotional response of what the player was, uh, was going to feel and dynamically change within that frame, within that paradigm, how the, um, how the, player, how the player feels. This is, uh, in a very simple sense, um, the uh, you know, revenge mechanic for uh, Clash of Clans and, of course, the Super Bowl commercial. Another game that has a very strong frame is Beat Saber. How many people have played Beat Saber? Yeah. And so you, know, you, wanna, you go in, you have lightsabers and boxes. You know exactly what to do because you've seen you know, Star Wars Episode V, right? the scene with Vader and Luke Skywalker. right? And then you might come to mind other things. But that, no, that tells you how to feel. So in a framework can add emotion to uh, this, and if, you had, if your AI is dynamically changing, exchanging frames, then you could actually create emotion over time, which is in a sense narrative. The second one is of course choice, which is what I named the talk after, red pill, blue pill, and the interesting thing about this is it's not just um, about a choice, like A or B in a branching narrative, but if you think about what red pill and blue pill really means, it's this, um, it's this really represents values, right? What, is the, what, is, what, are, your core, what are your core values? And uh, the red pill is, of course, harsh truth, and the blue pill is the convenient fantasy. What, in the, what about these decisions and what about these values could be mixed at? So there could be a whole layer of AI looking at the, um, the emotional values um, and worldviews about maybe how you see the world or even your capabilities could go in to make a much richer, richer um, type of choice. Another film, uh, Sophie's Choice, is a very gut-wrenching, um, is named after the very gut-wrenching scene where she has to choose between uh, one of her um, two children. So, spoiler there, my apologies. Uh, but it, it basically then affects everything that you do you know, thereafter. You might think of this as just, you, know, you design that, you could design that as a branching narrative, but it, what if an AI had that ability to provide you with a series of these choices dynamically as the game went through? So my murder mystery, my AR murder mystery could be, have quite a different playthrough time and time again. 
The uh, character's choice, you know, affects the past, the present, and the future. There's a mystery in the player's mind about the connections with these kinds of choices, and there's implied emotion around the events. Those would all be key traits to, uh, to bake into uh, the, the, the AI. And you could provide different perspectives, like who you play, you know, might change uh, how you feel about that particular event if you played a different, if you played a different role. And then speaking of characters, we go to uh, the onion, and uh, we've got different types of uh, choices that are revealed. So this is a way out of the branching narrative. I first thought of it when I worked on the Myst series. I did worked on three of the Myst games back in the day. And they have a lovely device, especially in the first one, of a book where the characters are gradually revealed page after page. And you have two brothers that you don't end up not wanting, at least I don't, want to help either of them, but you, have to, you want to finish the game. So they create tension that way. The, the players are just, those characters are pre-baked. You're just deciding by how much you help each one, how much you learn about them, and then, of course, how much power they have in the, in the world. Uh, Schindler's List has a, a character arc. Have people, have people watched Schindler's List? How many people have watched? OK, OK, good. Uh, how many people watched Sophie's Choice? Anyone seen Choice? OK, not, not as many. All right, Schindler's List then. Yeah, so for Schindler's List, what's interesting about him is he is part of the Nazi party at the beginning of the film, and then he arcs from that state to becoming, uh, to hiring out, you know, a thousand, rescuing a thousand Jews from the concentration camps to work in his, his factory. So he arcs as a character, which makes the film interesting. Crouching Tiger's Hidden Dragon also has two character arcs, and they're counter to each other. And so the character details re revealed gradually over time like an onion, and that their moral and their values and their goals are at cross purposes, which makes it quite, uh, quite an interesting, much more interesting kind of um, journey for the two characters. And then in terms of AI, there would be the character design, but then also the action and environment could be reflect that. So this is a piece of a fighting scene. Where again, these characters are arcing. The two women are arcing in a different direction than the guy is. And so you see that the, in the environment, it's actually, there is some, a bit of verbal, I mean, a visual play on what, on what the uh, characters are actually doing. So what kind of an AI system could generate that? Creating conflict and adversaries is a very crucial role for an AI as well. And Killmonger in This is Black Panther, Killmonger and Nakia, if you think about it from a narrative design perspective, they're actually the same, they have the same goals, right? They just have different methods and they've taken them to different extremes. I love this quote by uh, Joe Robert Cole, who's the, uh, the uh, screenwriter. And he says, I think the best villains have a uh, point of view that's relatable, that you can empathize with. Right, and that's how he built the character for Killmonger. And then it can also, um, uh, but it's not necessarily there, you, you share their perspective, but you don't exactly you know, agree with it. If we go deeper into like an AI for, um, uh, for character interaction, also the relationships are key. This is another scene from Black Panther. I would love to see an AI do this, create this on the fly. <laughs> So there's, a, there's an understanding of humor, there's an understanding of the relationships of the different characters, there's a, you know, and then how, that, how they all relate. That would be a really amazing experience. So the relationships affect the outcome of that battle that, in, in a very strong way. So lastly, I wanted to do a talk about items. And items can have an emotion profile, and they can be built into what we call an emotion uh, architecture, which is the, the actions, the, the whole structure of the way in which we interact, just like a, 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 your, your interactive architecture for your game. You might be able to express that with the, the choices that you offer a player. So here, the Black Panther is being offered you know, two different you know, high-tech uh, new, new Panther suits. He's tempted by the gold one, but he chooses the silver, the more sedate one. Uh, whereas, of course, the golden jaguar, his adversary, Killmonger, chooses the gold one. And uh, that relates a lot to different emotions and their different perspectives on the world. In Lone Echo, uh, which is a VR title, VR game, 
uh, character details are revealed gradually through the use of items. So you see different items that you can pick up and find out a story. So again, this is almost like an onion where you're just finding people, people more about people. It's already pre-baked. But you can, uh, you can get more into them, and you can also skip the story if you want to. But what would it take for a, uh, an AI not just to you know, leave around power-ups, but to create items that were particularly meaningful and significant and then worked with that particular character? A story AI might also, and this is uh, something that we're experimenting with at Zio, also use props to tell part of the story. Uh, this is Shape of Water. How many people have seen that? OK, good. It's a, yeah, so it's a very fascinating, she's a princess that has no voice. She's a, she's a cleaner in a, in a, um, in a uh, secret lab. Uh, and the props that she uses, the, the visual items in the world, are um, amazing storytelling tools. They actually you know, change the story as you, as you move over time. It's a lot of it is told visually. And so that's another way of not having a lot of, uh, of narrative. And if there were really deep uh, semantic understanding of items in the uh, AI, and then certainly for AR, a deep uh, ability to recognize objects and understand not only the object, like this is a microphone, or that's a tennis shoe, or that's a, a bottle of soda, but what is the, what is the, uh, the semantic meaning of it? Uh, and most of us have probably felt something about an object, like this is the companion cube. Yeah, any, any Portal fans out there? And so uh, AR, as, as I've said, semantic item recognition and use is gonna be very, you know, very crucial, because if I want my murder mystery you know, in, uh, in AR, in my living room, it's going to need to, it's gonna be much more fun if there are, in addition to virtual props, they're actually using the real props. And it is gonna need to know from us, from our play styles, understand us as players, whether it's more interesting to you know, hide the clue you know, under the um, coffee table or you know, under, the, under, the, under the chair. Oops. And then we've got um, AI you know, understanding the room around you, so we're playing with that. This is a, a landscape of wonders. And that's really, again, gonna be really crucial for uh, understanding uh, AR, I mean, understanding understanding the world for AR. So just imagine, uh, to wrap up, uh, let's reimagine, you know, say, God of War, which is a very emotional, very uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful game, is uh, what sort of frames does it bring, right? So this is you know, a, a, a clearly a combat frame. And the fact that it breaks a lot of the frames for the franchise created a lot of interest in the game, and I think is, 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 a, is a big part of why it was such a success. Uh, the frames that they, you know, you're exploring uh, in the in the game, you explore puzzles and you explore. There's an RPG element as well, but maybe we can explore relationships and items in more detail if we were going to frame it with um, with more AI. You obviously have choices about things to protect, and so that creates a lot of social emotions. And then, but then, why not uh, complicate things and then have you know more interesting, you know, relationships between the different different characters? So now you have to make some interesting, more interesting choices. What kind of character onions would be, what could you do dynamically to, um, to create these uh, characters as they arc over time? Uh, most of the AI here is, is pre-built in in terms of what they're going to do, the script, it's a, it's a, it has a standard structure. But if we had something that was more dynamic, what could, that, what could happen? And I think what we're gonna do is when we're gonna win in this is uh, you know, a narrative AI that could create something as compelling as the pyre scene, you know, gathering his, his wife's ashes in God of War but dynamically, you know, without any human intervention. So those, uh, that's it, those are the four, those are four frames so, uh, for narrative AI. Uh, frames, they do a lot of the work for you because you're, by association, you're automatically bringing a lot to the table as a, as a player. They come, a lot of emotions are kind of come from association. Your choice, you're gonna engage your belief systems of players, you know, through their, their system, through their philosophy, their worldview. Onions and arcs will either you know, deepen your relationship or arc your characters over time. And uh, items will all add in layers of emotional resonance and meaning, as well as bonuses and stats. Uh, a, a, so we've got the idea of layered AI, but then a word of caution is we can also do sentiment analysis. And uh, you know, as we've done with social media, for, for better or, or worse, there's some really great opportunities to create really compelling uh, you know, player engagement from you know, sentiment analysis of chat or utterances, or some of the, you know, obviously we could measure emotion in people's faces as well. So thank you very much, thank you for your time.
Uh, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Any questions? Uh, hello. Uh, so I was curious. Uh, there is a paradox games, Crusader Kings, which is known for ability to generate a lot of stories to I. So, uh, have you used it for in your research, and how does it fit in as uh, your scheme? Um, so, could you say the beginning of the question? Uh, the, the game Crusader Kings is able to generate a lot of stories, like to to I. Like, have you used it uh, as an example? How does it fit in in this? Yeah, scheme? I haven't. We haven't. You, we haven't done a specific study on on that one, unfortunately. Yeah, um, on on that particular title. Hmm. Sorry, but, but well, yeah, it, it's just like it's one of the games which is like has a uh, like a as a central feature, there's an ability to generate stories. Mm -hmm. uh, like. mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we want to look at is the um, so there's an interesting point in terms of stories is you know do we take it from um, the uh, I think a first step in uh, in addition instead of uh, trying to design create a story generator would be to create a moment-to-moment -moment generator. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you think about the birds and the planes for a moment, is that the, uh, the reason why a story might move us is that it is from our, um, uh, it is its ability to move us emotionally. And so if we, uh, and that's in the, all of the techniques from three, char you know, from character, um, from you know, three-act structure and, and that sort of thing, are all about designing ways of creating uh, emotions. And so if we look from the game design, we're going to actually be able to do more than stories do uh, by looking at, by being able to trigger emotions in our own unique ways, as well as, you know, with, with more traditional story arcs. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, first of all, great talk. Uh, thanks thank for you. coming out. Um, so I'm familiar with games like Gone Home to Coma, where the stories are very linearly driven, but you're interacting with environmental objects to build that kind of core narrative. Um, and that kind of reminded me of a lot of the onion arcs that you were talking about during your talk about peeling those layers back. So I was wondering how we could integrate generative AI and that kind of deep level of thinking to um, kind of pre-populate worlds with those narrative aspects to drive maybe a linear and even a more dynamic um, narrative story. Yeah, well, I think that the, what we're exploring is uh, we're looking at, um, say, a room like in Follow the White Rabbit. There's a, it starts in Paris, you know, a cafe in Paris. And it's about a magician who's been a charlatan like all his life until one day the magic actually works. So we start with uh, some, as reference, you know, some, some planned out, you know, ways in which you get out. It's an escape room. So ways that you would get out of the room and then uh, narrative arcs that would get you there. And then, then to break that up into more the micro uh, moment to moment, and then a uh, moment, uh, a mic micro moment to moment system, so that players could, in a sense, sort of mix and match their way uh, their way out of it. Uh, there is a feeling, a tension that I feel in games that have a very strong narrative, where I'm trying to uh, second guess the designer, whereas in like a murder mystery, you know, when I have like a murder mystery dinner at home with my friends, you know, we can much be much more free form. And we're trusting that there's going to be something interesting around the next corner. Uh, but not that we have to finish the maze in the same way each time. Uh, so I don't think that we have language to describe this other, these other patterns. But every time we bring something in from film, I think there's an opportunity to use it, to leverage it. And then there's also an opportunity to break it. So I try and have both of those design sessions. Uh, to to make it much more much more rich and again it's you know we're just getting started so I'm really looking forward to what people come up with awesome. so great thank question you. thank yeah. you uh -huh. which of the devices to create emotions that you described uh, were the most fruitful which one if you only had to use one which one gives the biggest bang for your buck for amount of effort well the uh, the most effortless one would be the one I started with would be frames because uh, frames are also icons. I talk a lot of, in my other talks about iconic design. If you use something that has an emotional resonance, you instantly get it. Uh, Disney in their line design will often do that, so like the old Pirates of the Caribbean new pipes a little bit, but as you're waiting for and then as you get on these dark rides, you're hit with you know here's a pirate, here's a pirate chasing a lady, here's a lady chasing a pirate. They're taking all these memes, all these tropes. And that is a fairly easy, if you had a library of those, you could put those into the player um, thing. But I think the second easiest one is, would of course be Onions, where it's a character arc that's already built. And you might be able to have um, three or four different Onions. 
and being able to shuffle the, those decks. And you would have some very interesting characters that change over time. Uh, and that would be a very, you know, much, much easier than trying to recognize the difference between a, um, you know, between a, a dollar bill and this, you know, box of water. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're just at time. So um, thank you. But if you want to, I'll be here in the back, I guess, after there's a, I guess, a speaker thing. Thanks very much for uh, having me, having me here. All right. I look forward to making what do you all get. <laughs>